When you have a show based on real life events airing on the History Channel, you expect it to be, well, you know, historically accurate, right? That's kind of their whole thing, yeah? Well, maybe. Or maybe not. Truth is, in the name of entertainment, the facts are always subject to change, even in tale told by history buffs. That's why today we'll be doing a deep dive into the historical inaccuracies of Vikings Valhalla. First off, what was Freydis Eric's daughter really like? We're starting with a more forgivable one here. Since the facts about Freydis may be lost to time to begin with, our only recounting of her life is in two conflicting accounts from Viking folklore written centuries after her death, though it is widely believed that she was a real person and the daughter of Eric the Red, illegitimate or otherwise, and therefore the sister of Leif Erikson. In her earliest depiction, the saga of the Greenlanders, she's, well, not painted in the nicest of lights. To make a long story short, she was said to have made a deal with two men to share a settlement 50-50, only to trick her husband into murdering them, which escalated into slaughtering the whole encampment, thereby claiming ownership of the whole thing, and you thought your neighbors were inconsiderate. The saga of Eric the Red places her in a much more heroic light, depicting her as bravely fending off attacking natives in spite of being eight months pregnant and showing up the men of her expedition in the process. They had all panicked while she stood her ground. As for the Viking Valhalla version, while they did capture the spirit of a very strong-willed and defiant woman, the devout paganism and revenge quest against the man who defiled her as a child seemed to be completely original. It would appear that instead of canonizing either of the the existing depictions, they decide to go a different route entirely. She's quite a bit easier to root for than the first incarnation, while not being as over the top as the second, so that's fair play really. But what about Prince Harold Sigerson? This one is a little harder to explain. Though he's a prince rather than a king and has a different last name, Harold Sigerson is known to be based upon Harold Hardrada, the man who became King of Norway in 1044. This is made clear due to his half-brother Olaf Haraldsson, who confusingly got to keep his real name, his real name that coincidentally made makes it sound like he's the son of Harold. Sorry, let's not complicate this any more than it has to be. In real life, Harold was born a full 40 years after Leif Erikson and his sister Freda, and is unlikely to have ever met either of them, so that's a bit of an issue right off the bat. Moreover, at the time of Leif's death, Harold could have only been as old as nine. And I've gotta say, that nine-year-old has got quite the beard. And to think, there's full-grown adults out there that can't even grow a mustache. The world is a cruel mistress indeed. Alternatively, might be a sign that the time frame is a bit out of whack. You be the judge. Harold, alongside his half-brother, actually went to war against King Canute in an attempt to reclaim Norway in Olaf's name. Though this failed and Olaf was killed, Harold was heralded, thank you, for his bravery, and that set him on the path to become a king himself, somewhat more ironic than that in the show. Both of the two brothers were part of an attack that helped put King Canute into power in the first place. Wait, no, that's not merely somewhat ironic, that's actually almost the exact opposite of what happened. Huh, bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? Up next, how did the London Bridge fall in real life? You're perhaps a little familiar with the famous nursery rhyme about London Bridge, but in case you haven't caught up on that one yet. Quick spoiler alert, it fell down. Okay, the spoiler's passed. You're safe now. In the show, this occurs as a result of a rather convoluted plan by Leif Erikson, which saw Canute deceive and corner King Edmund, forcing them to cross the bridge so that they may trap them on it. Then, Leif and company took to weakening and eventually destroying the bridge itself. This act was motivated by revenge as they sought justice for the victims of St. Bryce's Day Massacre, the killing of an untold number of Danish people perpetrated by Edmund's father, the late King Athelred. So how did this all go down in reality? Well, for starters, the bridge fell decades before the events of the story, which might actually be the famous incident in question, though it's possible that it was rebuilt in 990, only to be felt again. Skaldic lore tells a story in which Olaf destroyed it in 1014 as a means of dividing up the Danish forces, who were defending the walled city of London and Southwark. This would be a full 12 years after the massacre in question, and suffice to say, there's not much actual relation between the two events. And just to be absolutely clear, Leif Erikson certainly had nothing to do with it. Ah, well. At least they did show Olaf as a key figure in taking the bridge down. Even got a bit cheeky, implying his resentment for Leif getting all the credit for it. In that case, how did King Canute take over England? After that last one, you might be wondering what the real story is behind King Canute's rise to power. After all, in Vikings Valhalla, the falling of the London Bridge is a central piece in Canute taking the throne. Their version of history places it as the moment King Edmund fell out of power, and thus Canute the Great took over. Ah, uh, by the way, that's C-N-U-T, apparently the most accurate spelling of his name at the time. So, C-Nut then? That's pretty fun to say, actually. Alright, henceforth, he shall be referred to only as King C-Nut, and 
century, Sina took over the good old-fashioned way, or the good old-fashioned Viking way at least. He unleashed an intense campaign, raiding city after city until they had no choice but to submit to his rule. Eventually, King Edmund met with Sina to broker some kind of treaty, and well, the deal was quite favorable to the conqueror. He'd been given control of northern England, whilst Edmund would retain control of the south. But that's not all. It was also agreed that in the event of Edmund's death, Sina would take over his half of the country as well. And wouldn't you know it, mere months later, Edmund passed away, the details of which have been lost to time. Far be it for me to make accusations of centuries dead Vikings, but that timeline of events is a tad suspect, wouldn't you say? For some reason, I'm reminded of that saga of the Greenlander story from earlier. Hmm. Oh well. What about the St. Bryce's Day Massacre? After all that, you're probably wondering about the St. Bryce's Day Massacre itself. Was that even a real event in the first place, or did they just make it up to give our protagonist a sympathetic motivation for their assault on King Edmund? Well, on this one, the show is close to accurate. The massacre was very real, as the bones of 37 victims were discovered buried under St. John's College in Oxford in 2008, helping confirm the tale. As for the details, the story goes that King Athelred's kingdom had been dealing with Danish raids for a few decades, and thus, tensions rose with the Danish people. Athelred sought to solve this by paying tribute to the Danish king, and even took a wife of Danish heritage, seemingly in part to smooth things over. You know, that's just the kind of thing royal people did back then. Take a wife as a sign of good faith. Relations eased for a time, in which some Danish traders moved in, settled down, and raised families in Wessex. But the raids began again, and Athelred was told by an advisor that the Danish people within his kingdom would kill him and succeed him in an instant. Side note, Athelred would go down in history as King Athelred the Unready, a title that stemmed from an old English word meaning poorly advised. And this story is the reason why, because upon that bad advice, Athelred ordered the death of all Danes in England. This of course occurred on St. Bryce's Day, November 13th, 1002. But of course in many regions, this could not be carried out as the Danish population was too strong. The next year, a Viking invasion commenced, motivated partly out of revenge for this atrocity. The show follows this to a point, but depicts Athelred as already being dead by the time the Vikings arrived, when in reality, he survived for another 13 years, albeit being forced into exile through much of his life from that point forward. And that's all we have time for today. Which of these historical changes surprised you the most? Are there any glaring things we missed? Feel any different about the show now that you've heard all of this? Or do you think we're just being nitpicky? Let us know down in the comments below. And until next time, thanks for watching.